It's Your Health is brought to you by Good Cacao, the world's finest superfood chocolate. It's also my, my favorite chocolate. Be good, eat chocolate. Learn more at www.goodcacao.com. That's G-O-O-D-C-A-C-A-O.com. I'm so glad to have back to the program Dr. Michael McManman. He is the founder of the College Internship Program, also known as CIP. He has supported students with learning differences for his professional career spanning four decades. CIP IP will be celebrating its 30th year anniversary, its 30 year anniversary in 2014, and continues to provide comprehensive services and cutting edge curriculum at six centers nationwide. Dr. McManwin, welcome back to It's Your Health. Thank you for having me on, Lisa. It's so great to have you back on the show. I This is something that's so near and dear to my heart, having a, a daughter with learning differences. I am so grateful these programs exist. For people who haven't heard our prior interviews or aren't familiar with CIP, tell us a bit about it. Well, sure. CIP has comprehensive services for students 18 to 27. We have uh, six locations around the the country in California, Indiana, Florida, New York, Massachusetts. And we uh, work with learning differences in Asperger's syndrome. And, um, well, I guess we won't be calling it Asperger's syndrome anymore but ASD, and uh, we have comprehensive curriculum. So we do everything from life skills, apartment living, academic supports, career supports, um, and we have our own individualized curriculum within that on social thinking, executive functioning, sensory integration, uh, all those areas, plus the things that students need to know, like banking, budgeting, and um, you know, preparing foods, et cetera. That is so exciting. So this is an adjunct program to what they're doing at their state college, university, community college, right? right? And where are the six centers nationwide? Okay, so in California, we have one in Northern California in Berkeley, one in Long Beach in Southern California. In Indiana, we're near uh, Indiana University at Bloomington. Um, in, uh, we're near Buffalo in Amherst, New York, near University of Buffalo and Damon College. And in Massachusetts, we're in the Berkshires, in Lee, Massachusetts, and in Florida, we're um, in Melbourne, Florida, near Florida Institute of Technology and and, uh, Brevard Community College and some other schools. So this is really exciting that CIP is going to have its 30... It's 30th anniversary. I mean, that is incredible. How how have things changed since the beginning? Gosh, well, you know, when we started, I was the only... I had one other staff with me, and we had two students, and that was 30 years ago. And uh, really, things sort of stayed low for about 15 years. And um, the last 12 years, when I've been diagnosed myself with Asperger's, um, sort of has been a, a trajectory about the program developing because I think the more that I understood about myself and was able to start dealing with my social thinking difficulties, my sensory issues, and other areas, and using other people's brains and microcomputers to help me make decisions, that I've been able to really self-actualize in many areas, not just my at CIP, but in my personal life and in my art and all of my, you know, I have an organic farm now that I'm developing. So I've been able to self-actualize, and I think so. I'm sort of like the uh, poster boy for late diagnosis, and why people why it's really helpful to get diagnosed when you're older, um, because then you can really see what it is that's holding you back from completing, you know, your bucket list and your vision in your life. And I think programs like yours make such a huge difference. You know, I I wonder if some. Sh- you know, young adults would have trouble going to college if they didn't have something like this because exactly. you do need those executive functioning skills and the banking skills and the other things that lack in, in just a regular college situation. Right. I think increasingly Temple Grandin and everyone else are talking about the same things we've been talking about for years about the fact that you can't just do college on its own. You have to have the social, the sensory, the career areas combined so that the student comes out of not just a degree, but work skills, uh, relationship skills, all those other areas that they need. So we've, we've gotten that, we had that in our brains from the beginning. We're sort of fortunate that we started that way. And maybe as goofy as I am, as my 
in my own with my own Aspers, I sort of got it about that, and and sort of knew that they needed the clinical supports and other things too. And the problem is that you have, I mean, the good part is that you have colleges and programs at universities starting all over the country. We're the shining light on the planet. You know, I just got back from speaking in South Africa, and they they can't even imagine that we have the services we have over here. And so we have lots of things developing and all kinds of really cool ways of doing it. But there's a certain number of students, like about half of our students come from having gone to college already. And either they couldn't handle the sensory issues or the social issues in the dorm or or in the classroom, or they couldn't get their work in because they didn't have the executive functioning, or they didn't have the executive functioning in their apartment or their dorm room because they, they're totally disorganized. So there's all these other factors. They didn't know how to handle their meds or they didn't take them at college and if they were on them. So we work on all of those things in a comprehensive way, but really the core thing that they don't get out of college that we do is we introduce them to themselves by showing them what sensory issues you have, what executive functioning issues you have, what social thinking, and what their strengths are in each of those areas. Because once they know themselves, then they can truly go out there and create what they want. And even if they're a little bit resistant and um, or, uh, you know, cognitively rigid when we get them, usually that breaks down over time if they're here long enough with us. And if we don't, in some cases, get through to some of these kids, we don't sometimes in our allotted time, whether it's a year or two or three. And But what they're like elephants. We deeply embed the seeds. And then when they're out there in life, after they've left, because we do follow up studies and with our alumni, they bump into enough walls and they, they go back and they remember the curriculum and they remember the reframing classes about what they knew to do for themselves. And they start doing it in many cases. And it takes them longer than the average kid. We're talking about late 20s before they settle in usually and can find their way. So parents are in for a longer haul, and I think most of them know that than their regular college student. Oh, yeah. My husband and I have already had this discussion. <laughs> Our daughter's nine, but uh, she already told us she's going to get married and live at home with us. So I'm like, well, we'll, we'll see about that, dear. <laughs> Hope you like her spouse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. It just sounds so incredible. And I just find it so interesting, or maybe it's not a coincidence that you went into this line of work, even though you didn't know that you had Asperger's, you in our previous talks you, you knew something was different, right? About Well, you know, there's a multiple amount of reasons why I came into this work and mostly probably because I was an SB and didn't know it and needed help for myself which I admit now, but I also come from a family of multiple disabilities. I, I have um, a sister with ADD, two sisters with ADD, brother with Asperger's, a sister with high-functioning autism, and there was all co also all the comorbid things that go with it, anxiety, depression, uh, suicide, um, you name it. Well, I always say my family family was like the Kennedys without the money. You know, we had all the tragedy and all the problems. So I've actually, this is a serious thing, but I've had a sister with high-functioning autism and a brother with uh, Asperger's, who was a psychiatrist, both commit suicide. And, and I think a lot of that was due to their social understanding piece, where they, you know, even though they were, they had worked in the fields and stuff and been competent in many ways, I mean, really super competent, and take care of themselves in other ways. They just did not know how to break through in these areas. So that's why we say it's an inside job. I mean, I'm the sort of the beneficiary of, an, of these negative things because I've turned them into lemonade. And so I have this resilience quality that my mother taught me having overcome this with her own children and her mother, et cetera, a lot of other people in the family, lots of problems this resilience that says, you know, that you can always make things better each day and that so you work on your own, you know, areas. I work on my eye contact. I work on my ability to talk to people, I, problem solving, working as part of a team member, listening to people, all of these things that a lot of us Aspies don't do. You know, we're, we're brilliant, but we 
don't listen and we don't ask advice and we don't listen to it and we don't we don't know how to well work in sensory issues that with that bother us and stuff so and we think we're you know that the world needs to change to accommodate us but it's not going to I am so sorry about your brother and your sister mm-hmm. that is so well, there's more to the story but that's just a, a little bit of it Oh, I mean, just... seriously. So I always say, like, I was a psychologist by the time I was 10 years old mm-hmm. because I had to deal with all this. And you know what the funny part of that is? Is that even as, as limited as I was socially and emotionally in many ways, because of my Asperger's, I really knew what to do with them all. And I've been very effective in helping my family. But I knew what, to, I had them diagnosed. I knew what to do about it. But it's sort of like doctor cure thyself, you know, even though I knew it, I couldn't do it for me. And I and I still had those stumbling blocks in those blind areas uh, as a young adult and even into my 30s and 40s and 50s until I was diagnosed. I was limited in my success due to the fact that I didn't get it. And I can remember friends of mine walking away from me, shaking their heads, saying, you just don't, you're just going to run it, aren't you? You're just going to run it. In other words... I was so rigid, I wouldn't listen to their advice, you know, and uh, emotionally shut down from my sensory issues. So awareness is the first step for people out there who are listening. If you're, you know, a lot of women come to me and say, would you talk to my husband? And I, I know my son has this, but my husband has it too, and he won't do anything, and he's a scientist or whatever, you know. And so um, that happens sometimes, and I do get, refer them to different books. I say, what? you know, which book might serve them best, whether it's Stephen Shores or Daniel uh, Tammet, you know, in England. There's a lot of different self-stories of people on the spectrum which are helpful to people who want to understand themselves, like, you know, like John Robeson's books. Ah, yes. I love his books. Yeah. Well, I, just speaking to you, it just it gives me so much hope, and I know it gives a lot of listeners out there hope as well that we can send our kids to college if they have learning differences. And I'd love to talk about some of the other learning differences aside from ASD. Do you look at ADHD, dyslexia, CAPD, yeah. uh, things like no. nonverbal learning disorder, all that? Exactly. Okay. And they're all, each a little bit different learners. And the important thing is to, to you know, know what their learning style is. And if they're visual learners or auditory learners, or and what are their strong suits? How do they communicate best? How do they um, fit into the world? So that the student needs to know to use their strengths. You know, if you need to, if I had to sit up front in my classes in college, I was too intimidated because I thought they would ask me a question and I wouldn't have the perfect answer. So I sat in the back, but I'm a visual learner. And if I go to a conference now and I sit in the front, I get like nine-tenths more out of it than if I sit in the back. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to engage and be learning it the whole time. So that's something you learn about yourself. But so they need to learn about, you know, what's what's their learning differences and what are each area of their sensory issues, how do they make accommodations, how do they advocate for themselves, self-disclose, when should they do that, when shouldn't they do that, you know, all the... All of these areas of each area of our curriculum, they learn their strengths and their areas that they need to remediate or make accommodation with. And that, that's when they come out with their heads on straight, then they can actually make real, you know, self-actualized decisions for themselves, you know, and determine that's all that's really happened with me is that I've, I'm very, I mean, I've reached the, the area of self-determination. Like, I know that I can get the answers if I don't know what fertilizer to use on my organic farm. I can go to the North, you know, New England Organic Farmers Conference and find out. And I can ask everyone and I can get a sample of them and try them in my greenhouse. And You see what I'm saying? Oh, so yes. once, once you learn, the world is our candy store because we're smart enough. We just don't know how to socially and sensorily get along in the world with people. And, and, uh, and that's a big, huge stumbling block whether you have a college degree or not. Oh, definitely is. Now, is there going to be some sort of special celebration in honor of the 30-year anniversary of CIP? Right. It's also my semi-retirement party. I'm really sort of trying to retire. But, yes, but I mean, not. I'll be still doing things like this and teaching and, and lecturing and stuff and showing up to, to bother them. But, <laughs> um, 
but mostly I'm going to be, um, you know, doing my farm and going about with my, I have 14 grandchildren. And oh, terrific. Six children that I would like to see once in a while. <laughs> and uh, so I want to spend some time doing that. And, uh, but the 30th year of anniversary of CIP is also my semi-retirement or retirement, but I guess it's sort of a formal thing. And that's coming up in January. And then we also, what one thing that we're starting this year, which is new, is we, we have our high school summer programs at each site already. There are six of them around the country, and there's there are 12 kids we take at each area, and they're always full, kids 16 to 18 or 19. And um, it's like a two-week program in the summer, and we have them on a college campus near us. Anyway, those have been very successful, but last year we started with one that was called Beyond High School, which is for older students who have been either out of high school doing nothing or tried college and are just drifting along and a little bit, a little at a time, but they really need uh, something different. So we've been having, we started one in Florida, but we're having six of those at each, one at each center next year. So it'll be like in the two high school summer, I mean, high school summer program and a beyond high school summer program at each location around the country. We uh, had the first one last year. Those are for older kids, like in their 20s, early 20s, who have usually been floundering. Either they did some college or they they might have even completed a, a degree, but they are not going anywhere socially and career-wise and things like that because they didn't got they have the benefit of the kind of programming we do in our program. So it's sort of a different audience, but the same problems. The problem is if they get beyond that 23, 24-year-old to 27, 30, they get so rigid by that point. And we're seeing that in the news with, you know, I mean, you know, they did say Adam Lanza has Asperger's syndrome, right? Oh, that he yes. was diagnosed with it. Now, I'm not, he's a extreme example of someone who had a severe emotional problem on top of it. But just the part that was interesting to me was how his life caved in around him. Like the mom couldn't take him in a, on a plane anywhere. She couldn't take him in a car. That he would only go, you know, certain places. He wouldn't come out of his room for this. She had to talk to him. She had to email him within the house to talk to him. And so these kids, the default mode of people on the spectrum, me included, is to push everyone away and to have a safe place where we know the world on the computer or in our art or whatever we're doing, and we push everyone away. And that's even after college or something because we, go, we tend to go back into ourselves unless we learn that that's the exact opposite of what we need to do for ourselves. And we learn how to reach out, to advocate for ourselves, to form alliances, friendships, get people that can help us. There's always people that want to help us out there. But after parents die, obviously, or move on and get older, this is the assurance that they want, that their kid knows how to do this for himself and can stand on their own two feet and can hopefully make some money and have a relationship and be happy and not be isolated on their own, uh, not being able to take care of themselves. So that's everyone's nightmare, but there's also solutions to it. And unfortunately, we have a you know, we don't have government funding for most of that now. In California, we have a, a, a good majority of our students are state-funded into the program. But out here in the, in the East and everywhere else in the country, maybe an enlightened school district occasionally will pay for a year of this after someone's finishing off if they didn't do well with them. But for the most part, you're on your own, and that's the problem. And it's expensive proposition. You know, it's not cheap, but we do give, a, you know, about $500,000 in aid a year to different students. But no matter what, all the services that we do, you can put that together. A parent, if doesn't have the resources, they can try to put together the best package they can for their student in the different areas, like a mentor, you know, a therapist, a executive functioning coach or whatever. So they have to do what you have to do depending upon what you can afford to do. Yeah, you definitely do. See, I, I'm already thinking, oh, I'm going to be around. I eat healthy and I take care of them. I'll be around until I'm 100 and something. So she'll be in her 70s. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I hope so, but you, that, you that's can't. That's either a positive or a negative for your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you handle it. 
<laughs> Good point. Well, Dr. McManaman, as always, it's such a joy to speak with you. Tell us how we learn more about the college internship program. Well, sure. Simply just Google college internship program, and you're going to get, like, pages and pages, more than you want to know. And our website, you know, collegeinternshipprogram.com. But if you Google my name, Michael McMahon, you'll get, like, 20, I can't believe how many pages of stuff is out there on me now. How good. Well, well, gosh, they must, I, it's really crazy. And there's every kind of video in the world on there. So if you're interested at all in what I said, you can go on there and look. Um, but collegeinternshipprogram.com. Well, it's always such a joy to have you on, and congratulations, and have fun with your 14 grandkids. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> one, one at a time, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about sensory okay. overload. <laughs> well, have a nice Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening. For more information, go to itsyourhealthnetwork.com.